Chapter 6, John's Alpha and Raina Once again I awakened to the voice of central information. I immediately interrupted to ask how long I had been asleep. But this time C.I. said it could not give me this information since my Alpha Room chair was not designed to be a body-mind monitor, as with the chairs in the library. I decided, however, that since Carol was not back yet, I must have once again returned within only seconds of 2150 time. I decided to ask C.I. some of my troublesome questions. You know, C.I., all the switching back and forth in time has played havoc with my life in 1976. My brother thinks I'm heading for some kind of psychotic break. When he presented his arguments, I had to admit that he was making a strong case. We decided to settle the matter once and for all by devising a test of reality of 2150. If I can develop some of my macro powers that you described and demonstrate them back in 1976, then Carl and I will accept 2150 as a reality. If not, then we'll have to accept my dreams as a massive escape device, which I designed to relieve the tensions created by uninterrupted years of study. Tell me, is it possible for me to develop some of these macro powers? And if I do, will I still have them when I get back to 1976? C.I. answered with one unqualified word. Yes. Is it possible for me to stay in 2150 permanently? I asked next. Yes. If you attain third level awareness, you may stay in 2150 permanently, was her answer. When will that be? That depends entirely on your desire and your belief that it is possible. Well, how long will it be before I develop some macro powers, I asked. C.I.'s response could have been a recording of her previous one, for she said, that depends entirely on your desire and your belief that it is possible. Thinking that perhaps some mechanical failure had caused this identical response, I asked C.I. my name to see if her tape was stuck. Her response was, John Lake is your 1976 name. Your 2150 name is John 8, 927, since there have been seven other Johns born in Delta 927. How long will it be before I develop some macro powers, I persisted. That depends entirely on your desire and your belief that it is possible, was still the response. While I was disappointed in not being able to find out how long it would take me to develop some of the macro powers, I was delighted that they could be demonstrated back in 1976, and kind of tickled somewhere inside to hear my 2150 identification. The knowledge that I could stay permanently in 2150 if I did attain third-level awareness brought me deep pleasure and relief, yet there was something unanswered that bothered me. It was my concern for my body back in 1976. I asked C.I., if I reach third-level awareness and stay permanently here in 2150, what will happen to my body back in 1976? C.I., who was a woman of few words, said simply, It will die. I was trying to cope with this prospect of dying and living all at the same time when Carol returned with my macro identity bracelet. Here's your own personal mib, John, Carol said with a smile as she slipped it onto my wrist. I marveled at its lack of weight for in spite of its multiple functions of timepiece, nutrition dispenser, heart and brainwave monitor, and communication cell, for those with limited telepathic power, it weighed considerably less than my 1976 wristwatch. Carol explained that it was waterproof and practically indestructible. When I asked about its power source, she replied that all equipment, from MIBs to their largest transportation vehicles and servo mechanisms, receive their power from what's called a Central Information Power Broadcasting Center. I asked her if this was an atomic power center, and she responded with an emphatic denial, explaining that atomic waste had contributed greatly to the pollution problems of microman. Then she explained how cosmic radiation was combined with the forces created by the movement of the Earth. These were captured, reactivated, reflected, and amplified by a crystal, then broadcast, creating a central power source. Power was obtained through electroacoustical tuning to this energy source. Once this had been accomplished, man was no longer dependent on any other power source, and the world's fuel pollution problems were over. When I asked more about the crystal and how it worked, Carl said that the tunics we wore employed a very similar crystal structure and process in miniature. She went on to tell me how they had learned to recycle and use all waste products so that the planet Earth was the cleanest in recorded history. I remember the sparkling clarity and sweetness of the air of 2150 and tried to imagine rivers, lakes, and oceans free of refuse and wastes. Carol asked C.I. to show us pictures of the earth as it existed in 2150. I spent the next few minutes looking at an earth transformed into a Garden of Eden, no longer the vast, ugly oil slicks on our waters, 
no longer the dirty yellow air or the deadly unseen gases saturating our atmosphere, no longer the ugly sprawling cities functioning as planetary sewers, all of Microman's ugly sloth had been removed. How had we ever cleaned it up? I asked Carol. She smiled and said, it wasn't difficult for Macroman. Just as it was inevitable that Microman would turn his world into an open cesspool, it was also inevitable that Macroman would turn the same world into an earthly paradise. You see, she went on, the soul of Microman evolves into Macroman. Then the adult cleans up after the child. We must not forget that we were all once children, once the very same micro-beings who fought and polluted and destroyed everything, including our micro-selves. We don't condemn Microman, she said, for that would be to condemn our own childhood, which would force us to forget it. We don't want to forget our past because we don't want to have to repeat it. I admired Carol's strong convictions concerning personal responsibility, but I asked, can you really remember your past lives? Yes, of course, she replied calmly. I can remember living as a man during your 20th century. Planetary pollution was the major cause of my death in the 1990s. I started to say something, but she interrupted me by saying that when I was ready to remember past lives, I would be given the help I needed. Then I would more fully understand the truth of reincarnation and karma. Then she changed the subject, asking me if I was familiar with how the timepiece portion of my MIB worked according to metric time. I told her that I remembered CI explaining the metric time system to me as part of an answer to one of my questions, but I wasn't too sure of it. So we spent the next few moments reviewing metric time with CI, providing the helpful illustrations and charts. I won't use this journal to present all the intricacies of the metric time system. However, briefly, the 2150 calendar began in the spring with the vernal equinox and was divided into 10 months of 100 days each. A metric day was approximately 8.6, 1976 hours, and was divided into 10 metric hours, which would have approximately 51.8, 1976 minutes each. For further details, see the CI data excerpts at the end of this book. As it was adjusting to 100 minutes in an hour and 100 seconds in a minute, Carol suggested that it was time to meet the other Alpha members in person. We found them sitting in the circle of chairs at the end of the common room. The most unnerving thing to me about the macro power of telepathy was the complete silence which greeted us as we joined the circle. The eight minds probed my own, which felt powerless to resist. I tried to return their eye contact, but found myself repeatedly lowering my eyes self-consciously. Alan, our Alfar, took my left hand and placed his right hand firmly on my cheek. His eyes engaged mine silently for a few seconds. Then he said, "'Welcome to our Alpha, John.' I'm Alan Six. Forgive us for not speaking sooner. It is our custom to first meet with our eyes and minds, then with our touch, and lastly with our voices, if that seems desirable. Soon you'll develop the macro power of telepathy, which will make it easier for you. You'll still have another important barrier to overcome, though, before you'll be comfortable with our traditional affectionate greeting. I noticed, he continued, that when I touched you, your aura retracted. That, of course, indicates that you're uncomfortable sharing through touch. This may be a reflection of your culture's archaic taboo against men touching one another. However, it could be an indication of your submission to astrological influences. You've read enough astrology to know that most Virgos prefer that people stay their distance. This would be a cripplingly divisive astrological influence. It should be overcome through mental control and practice. Whichever influence is causing this retraction response will be overcome soon, and we'll all help you do it. As we introduce ourselves, keep in mind that we intend no harm, and see if you can give something of yourself to the greeting. Imagine the atoms that make up your being reaching lovingly, joyously out toward this person you're greeting. This establishes electromolecular paths, which will make it easier for us to communicate with you. Let's start with my alpha mate, which brings me to another point, John. You'll find that we in 2150 present ourselves to you as opposed to being introduced by a third party. We find it more honest, more clear, simpler. Perhaps most importantly, it permits people to communicate at will, anytime, anywhere, for any reason, without the cumbersome burden of archaic formalities. We just engage eyes, extend our hands, pronounce our name, and communicate our thoughts, either telepathically or verbally. 
As he said this, he turned and gestured to the beautiful girl sitting next to him. Her sweet face broke into a smile that was reflected by the sparkle in her eyes. She said, I'm Bonnie. Welcome to our Alpha, John. Kneeling beside me, she took my left hand with hers while pressing her right hand warmly against my cheek. She was back in her chair before I had recovered. Then she gestured to the handsome, dark-eyed young giant sitting beside her. As he approached, I prepared to stand up, feeling self-conscious about the fact that I had not paid Bonnie this courtesy. Please don't stand, John. I'm Adam. You'll find we in 2150 do not burden our lives with unnecessary social protocol to show respect or to honor one person above another. We each know our own value and presume mutual respect without formalities to proclaim it. Lost for what to say, I played it safe and simply said, Thank you, using my voice for the first time since I joined the circle. You're very kind. Looks like I have a lot to learn. Gingerly, I returned his gesture of affection. Then Adam's alpha mate, Nancy, was kneeling before me, introducing herself, while I yielded to the depths of her liquid brown eyes. This was followed by meeting a smiling David, who possessed the shoulders of a Hercules, and his alpha mate, Diana, whose body was the smallest, at six feet one, but in magnificent feminine proportions. Then I met the Goliath of our Alpha, six foot nine inch Steve, whose giant body was balanced by a face that radiated paradox of mischief and patient kindness. The last member was Vivacious Joyce, with lovely green eyes and dark auburn hair, which made me wish they wore their hair longer in 2150. Perhaps the most striking physical qualities were their penetrating, all-knowing eyes, their short hair, their giant stature, which made me at six feet three the shortest male by two inches, and their remarkable physical beauty. Like idealized Greek statues, the women were lovely and the men were handsome. However, unlike the 20th century, where physical beauty was rare and sought after, no one here was self-conscious about his appearance. Carol had told me that they valued the beauty and power of the mind more than that of the body. I remembered, however, that C.I. had stated that the body reflected the mind and the mind reflected the spirit, so I knew they would not ignore or take lightly their physical health and beauty. I was surprised at how warmly and positively they responded to me and I to them. Overcoming my typical 1970s aversion to touching, I was coming along nicely, partly, I suspect, due to the fact that I honestly liked them all, and not with the usual superficial type of regard that I generally felt on first meetings back in the 20th century. It was surprising, but I felt a deep personal involvement with all of them. Somehow they radiated a quality of trust and positive regard that made it impossible for me to feel indifferent or defensive. I could relax with them, for they were my friends already. My very best of friends. Someone entered the room, and I turned to find an absolutely perfect, beautifully sculptured man. I had thought of Greek statues of women, and here was one of a male, vibrantly alive. His tunic was a glistening white with the faintest suggestion of iridescent colors playfully showing here and there. I wanted to burst with joy just looking at him and feeling his incredible strength, his power. He took my hand, and placing his huge but gentle hand on my face, said, I feel your thought, John, and the joy is returned. It's so good to have you with us at last. He squeezed my hand affectionately. Happy growing, John. We are one. And was gone before I could respond. What happened? Where did he go? Who was he? My questions almost tripped over one another. That was Eli, our Katar. He, like other level tens, travels about on thought. And he had to get back to what you would think of as the planet Uranus, where he's been very busy helping clear up some problems in their magnetic field. This leaves him very little time to spend here on Earth, but he did want very much to greet you and to welcome you to 2150. I groped mentally for a frame of reference into which to fit what I had just heard. You mean that he just thinks himself from planet to planet? That's right, Joyce answered. Level 10s spend a lot of time away from Earth helping others and growing. Evolved souls from other planets spend much time here helping us, too. Alan suggested something that first made me think I had misunderstood, for it sounded like he had said, let's dance. His suggestion was immediately received with shouts of agreement. He took my hand, and we ran after the others down the long living room. What happened during the next 15 or 20 minutes was almost unbelievable to me. Suddenly, the great room was filled with the most exciting music I'd ever heard, 
imagine strenuous folk dancing like spirited polka or offenbach's gate parisienne numbers and the twirling dervishes combined with the virginia reel square dances gymnastics tumbling and a relay race of sprinters at a track meet and you'll have only part of what they call the macro dance they leaped they tumbled they ran they joined together they separated they joined they twirled they cartwheeled they pyramided they helped me join in all of these and more until my heart pounded like a sledgehammer and my breath came in whistling gasps then we all threw off our tunics and ran naked out the door of our alpha and down the halls to the giant swimming pool on our beta floor we plunged laughingly into a pool thirty yards wide and ninety yards long my unspoken question of why the pool was so large was soon answered as we were joined by the rest of our seventh triad beta ninety more naked laughing youths of eighteen nineteen or twenty who had just finished the macro dance in their alphas again i was struck by their physical beauty joy and friendliness there was no shallow end to this pool so we all swam in the ten foot deep water either above or below the surface since everyone seemed to be as at home in the water as a herd of sea lions only a few minutes passed however before carol told me it was time to leave we climbed out of the pool and i suddenly realized that we were the only ones out of the water as i turned to see if the other members of our beta were going to join us i heard their voices shouting welcome john welcome a lean muscular giant with piercing dark eyes vaulted out of the water took my hand in his and touched my cheek firmly but gently immediately there was total silence he was at least five inches taller and seventy pounds heavier than i in spite of being six years my junior he looked long into my eyes but this time i did not feel uncomfortable and returned his look with confidence and a powerful feeling of contentment welcome john to our seventh triad student beta he said in one of the deepest voices i had ever heard my name is leo and i'm the betar of our floor i speak for all when i say that we're glad you've joined us thank you i replied then raised my voice so all could hear and said thank you all for this wonderful welcome you can see with your minds how happy i am to be here no words can express my joy then the rest of my alpha was about me we ran back to our rooms to put on fresh tunics then met in the dining room for dinner it was a leisurely meal with lots of laughing and talking and i had an opportunity to appreciate the remarkable intelligence broad knowledge and varied interests of my alpha I also had the opportunity to try some strange new foods that I found delicious, but did not ask what they were made of. Everyone cooperated, seeming to sense that I would enjoy the meal more if I was not forced to consider the content of the food I was eating. Perhaps the most satisfying experience was their understanding and reassurances concerning my fears about my sanity back in 1976. I told them of my conversations with Carl, and how we'd set up our test of the reality of my experiences in 2150, they were unanimous in approving this kind of test. It was Alan who told me that the whole macro society was aware of my time translation and very interested in whether or not I could learn to remain there permanently. Then Joyce, of the lovely green eyes and short auburn hair, said that while I was a world celebrity, I would experience none of the invasions of privacy that 20th century celebrities experienced. Since CI contained any and all information about me and the experiment of which I was a central part, Anyone desiring knowledge concerning me or the experiment could simply ask C.I. I told him that I appreciated this and added that I could get rich fast if I could offer this convenience to the famous people back in 1976. There are dozens of questions we'd like to ask you, John, if you don't mind, Alan requested. Not at all, I replied, and I'd like to ask all of you some questions, too. Steve explained that while there were no taboo questions for them, they realized that in 1976 there were many subjects that people avoided because of their feelings of guilt associated with these subjects. I talked about this for a minute and then said, Feel free to ask me any question on any subject, no matter how uncomfortable it makes me. My reason for this is that I want to become a permanent member of your macro society, so I'd better learn to be as aware of myself and as clear as you are. For the next few minutes I was overwhelmed with questions about my life in the 20th century and my feelings toward my parents, my teachers, my government, and the many churches and religions. They were interested in my feelings about culture, economics, racial, religious, language differences, all the things that divided my man. I felt no restraints in answering these questions and realized that as yet they had not asked anything that made me feel uncomfortable. Before they got around to that, David suggested that I be given a chance to ask some questions myself. I thanked him and began with general questions concerning their feelings about the macro society. 
They were genuinely surprised that I should think their society over-regimented and restricted. Allen seemed to summarize their answers in this area. In the macro society, we have more freedom to experience ourselves and the world about us than ever before in the history of man. As for repressive, over-regimented societies, we have no policemen, no armed forces, and no government to pass silly laws that people want to break. What do you mean? I asked. I mean, Allen replied, that we don't have all those laws that almost everyone broke. Laws against alcoholic drinks, gambling, various sexual acts, and drugs, for example. You people back in 1976 had so many laws which were conflicting and confusing that your people had to hire lawyers to protect them from their own neighbors as well as from their own government. Consider the maze of laws that governed marriage, divorce, and taxes. Of course, these would not have been perpetrated if your lawyers had not a vested interest in keeping them on the books. But you have to have laws or everything would be chaos, I replied. We have no laws, and we have no lawyers, responded Nancy, and we don't have chaos. But you do have laws, I insisted. You must have. How about stealing? What if I steal your belongings? They all laughed, and lovely little Diane, the smallest one, at six feet one, said, Go ahead and take anything we have. All material possessions are free, and we'll be glad to give you anything you want, so you can see that there's no need to steal. Hmm. All right, I said. But how about murder? You must have laws against that. I thought I had them with that one. But Bonnie smiled, revealing her charming facial imperfection, dimples. She said, In your 20th century, you had no laws against flying to the stars, because no one believed it possible. She paused and seemed to overwhelm me with her intense blue eyes as she continued. We in the 22nd century believe it's impossible for macro man to murder anyone. There are no laws against it. She so distracted me that I momentarily forgot about laws and asked whether the science of 2150 made it possible for people who were not yet level 10 to visit other planets. She explained that macro man just used astral projection to explore the universe. I was reminded of my astral body traveling to 2150 and then informed that some 8th and ninth level and all ten levels, were able to use astral travel not only in our physical universe, but in other dimensions beyond the fourth one of time. That was more than I could grasp, so I went back to laws. All right, I said. How about your educational laws? All 18, 19, and 20-year-olds have to live in a seventh triad student beta, and until you reach 30, you must live in a student gamma. How about that? Again, they all laughed, and darkly handsome Adam said, but no one forces us to live in a student gamma. The macro society is set up so that our needs for companionship, love, learning, exercise, recreation, and everything else are best served this way. We're free to leave any time we want to, but we're not masochists, so we seldom go against our own best interests. Now Alan got up from our long dining table and said, Because the macro society lives according to the one macro imperative, loving acceptance, we cooperate. Thus, conflict is impossible. However, we still have micro-people living on micro-island who dedicate their lives to amnesiac forgetfulness of the macro-oneness of all. Only in this way of deliberately forgetting our macro-origin can we behave in micro-selfish ways that damage ourselves and others. Well then, I said, you at least have laws against micro-man since you force them to stay on a prison island. Not at all, Alan replied. It's only their lack of desire and belief that keeps them there. In fact, we maintain free training on the island for anyone who wants to remember his macro origins and thus return to the macro society. And we don't interfere with them in any way that would restrict or punish any of their activities on micro island. They're free to do anything they like as far as we're concerned. They stay pretty busy passing laws and enforcing them so they can survive selfishly and competitively. I changed my tactics now and decided to ask a very personal question. Did you vote for Alan as Alfar and Leo for Betar because you thought they would be the best leaders or because CI says they're level 6 and 7? My Carol had been allowing others to supply questions and answers for me, but now I looked directly at her for her response. She glanced at the others and obviously decided that she had their permission to speak for them, for she said, We voted for Alan and Leo because as long as we have known them, since our first and second triads, they've demonstrated superior macro qualities. C.I. only reflects what we already know. No one can possibly fool anyone else about his level of awareness because our tunic colors make no mistakes. C.I. only formally confirms what our tunics have already told us. I see, 
I responded, switching around. Well, how about jealousy? What if you have sex with somebody else's alpha mate? Once again, I heard their amused laughter as Giant Steve answered for the group. Sexual relations must have been one of Microman's most exciting and challenging diversions. The popular 11 p.m. syndrome, waiting for the late hour to bring enough drowsiness for soft music and quiet talk to lower a woman's resistance so you can conquer her taboos, isn't needed here in 2150. We have no taboos, no hidden dark areas, and thus no desire to use others as possessions for our own selfish micro-purposes. Well, are you saying that you wouldn't be jealous if Adam or David began having sex with your Joyce? Steve smiled a kind and patient smile. First of all, she is by no means my Joyce. She is her own Joyce. Secondly, it would be surprising if Adam or David wanted to have a sexual relationship with Joyce, since it would be totally out of character with their lifestyles. But I couldn't be jealous, because if it made them happy, it would make me happy too. If it did not make them happy, they would have learned a valuable lesson, and we would all rejoice in their new growth. But why would you be surprised, I asked, not understanding this part at all. He'd be surprised, Joyce answered, because by the seventh triad, we're focusing on greater depth dyadic relationships with our alpha mates. We've explored polyadic sexual relationships from the first through the fifth triads, and by the seventh triad, we're no longer interested in childish activities, not because they are bad or wicked, but because we've simply outgrown them. You've outgrown being sexually attracted to each other? I asked incredulously. Oh, never, they laughed. Then Joyce explained the analogy that admiring a painting or a statue was very different from wanting to take it home, hide it away where no one else could see it, and keep it all to yourself. I was thinking that her analogy didn't do much for me, when Diane said that they realized I had not had their early triad experiences, and so, of course, any of the girls in my alpha or beta would help me with whatever sexual problem I may have. I was stunned. Are you telling me that any girl on this floor would be willing to have sex with me? That's right, Carol replied. If you approach someone in 2150 who doesn't feel it's in the best interest of both of you to spend time together, she'll just say, thank you. I care, but I don't feel we're harmonic. However, there's no girl in the whole gamma or even Delta who would refuse you, so it won't be fear of rejection that'll stop you, and I assure you neither Leon nor I will be jealous. I shook my head, trying to clear its conflicting thoughts and feelings. Then I said that with all my sexual frustrations and guilt, they would be taking an awful chance with me. They might feel like they were being raped. But rape is impossible in the macro society, Bonnie said, since no one would resist, and, since macro-beings could not enjoy the micro-use of sex, the macro-society would not satisfy micro-man's twisted sexual needs. It's incredible, she observed, how often during the 20th century blackmail and political scandals could have as their focal point someone's sexual behavior. Your ridiculous social sanctions against homosexuality and extramarital sex did far more to encourage these behavioral patterns than to extinguish them. Do you mean that you people don't object to homosexuality, a man making love with a man or a woman with a woman? I asked incredulously. Of course not. You'll find, however, that there is a much lower incidence of homosexuality here in 2150 because of a few factors. First, we have eliminated the social situations that often caused homosexuality, like loneliness, unfulfilled needs, pernicious social myths which tell you that if you enjoy the touch of someone the same sex, then you must be a homosexual. Second, when a soul incarnates into the physical body of one sex while still carrying with it emotional, spiritual, or mental selves that are overwhelmingly the opposite sex, you must naturally expect expression of the predominant sex. This is neither abnormal nor undesirable. It's true, natural, and logical. Third, as we evolve to higher levels of awareness, the masculine and feminine forces within us become more perfectly balanced, till we ultimately reach a point where we are once again emotionally, spiritually, and mentally androgynous. Your micro-society, in its isolationist ignorance, would call this state of total at-oneness sick. Well, I don't know much about androgynism, but homosexuality is sick, isn't it? I questioned. Steve explained, In some cases, yes. In some cases, no. Just like heterosexuality, which is, in some cases, what you would call very sick in some cases not. As with all else, it depends totally on the motivation. 
We talked some more about the problems of our micro-society and their macro-society solutions to these problems. Then Alan said he must leave and visit his personal evolution tutor. Carol looked at her mib and said it was time for some macro-counseling, popularly called personal evolution tutoring. We said our goodbyes, and everyone left the Alpha together in pursuit of his or her tutor. I asked Carol about personal evolution tutoring. CI had told me that PE tutoring was the core of formal education in the macro society, but it hadn't meant much to me. Carol explained that PE tutoring was a learning relationship between a tutor with a larger viewpoint or life perspective and a student with a smaller perspective who wanted to learn a larger one. While all triads and PE tutors, beginning with the seventh triad and continuing through the tenth, students are assigned to the wisest tutors in the macro society who had a minimum of seventh level awareness. This meant that most of these tutors were beyond the age of 50. The 11th and 12th floors of the Student Gamma Building were devoted to comfortable tutoring rooms large enough to accommodate both individual and group work. There were also exercise rooms and an auditorium big enough to hold the entire gamma. We arrived at our personal evolution tutoring room after walking through multicolored halls with gleaming white doors. Carol reached out to open the door, but before she touched the button, the door slid quietly open. We entered a room with a carpet-like floor of deep blue, which contrasted with the soft yellow walls and the large forest green chairs. The room was at least 25 feet square and seemed huge, with just three chairs and no other furniture. One of the chairs was occupied by the smallest woman I had seen in 2150. As we walked toward her, she rose from her chair and stretched out her arms to us. Carol immediately slipped into her arms, and they gave each other a silent embrace. Then, as Carol stepped back, I realized that our tutor was even shorter than I had first thought, being no taller than five feet ten at best. As she stepped forward and took my hand, I became aware of her age. Her face and body were those of a very healthy and extremely attractive woman in her mid-forties, but somehow her pale blue eyes gave me a feeling that she was much older. She touched my face and said, Welcome, John, to the Macro Society. I'm Raina and I'll answer your question by saying that I have inhabited this body for 125 years. As I was trying to adjust to this fact, Carol said, and to answer your question about how the door opened by itself, you were experiencing Raina's demonstration of psychokinesis, or PK, preceded by telepathy. Raina's tunic was the same gleaming white as Eli's. Level 10s were so highly evolved that their tunics reflected a perfectly equal balance of all colors, resulting in the illusion of no color at all. I felt awed when I remembered that there were only 127 level 10s in the whole macro society at present, and I wondered if I was getting some special treatment. Raina smiled at me and said, no, no special treatment. I was Carol's tutor long before you arrived, and since you're alpha mates, you can choose me as your tutor or ask for somebody else. Uh, I guess, I guess I'd probably choose you, I stammered. Then let's sit down and let's get growing, she responded cheerfully. We sat down in the soft, body-contoured chairs, and I began wondering what would be expected of me. Carol came to my rescue when she asked Raina if she could see into the future and tell us how long it would be before I would become a permanent member of the Macro Society. Raina looked intently at Carol for a moment and then shifted her intense gaze to me. Finally, she said, I'm having difficulty with the future for John because it seems there is a very important decision that he must make, which will completely determine the rest of his life. This decision will be his choice between the micro-life of 1976 and the macro-life of 2150. I've already made that choice, I insisted. I've chosen the macro-life of 2150. Rena looked at me and I felt her tremendous strength of patience, understanding, and courage. I suddenly realized that from the moment I had entered the room, I had been mentally and physically bombarded by the power of her being. As I write this, I feel frustrated that I cannot find words to describe her. Perhaps an electrical essence stimulated me in so many ways that I felt overwhelmed. It was Carol who broke the silence. You don't think he's totally really made the choice yet, she said to Raina. Raina looked at Carol and then back to me before she said, I think that John has not had time to really take inventory of himself. He feels confused and in great awe and tends to see us as being too impossibly perfect for him to become one of us. As I thought about what she had just said, I realized that she was right. I did feel that everyone I had met so far in 2150 was impossibly perfect compared to me. In fact, I could see no weakness and no imperfections. I nodded my head in sad agreement with Raina. 
You're right, I said. I feel like a first-grade kid who finds himself accidentally in seventh grade. The lessons look impossible. My fellow students must look down on me, because while they're years younger than I am, they're miles ahead of me in their evolution. Oh, John, it isn't true, Carol said in an imploring tone. We all love you and accept you as you are. We don't judge you any more than we judge each other. We're all of equal value, and we all have to be first level before we can evolve to second, third, or beyond. When I didn't say anything to this, Rena said, You see, Carol, John feels you're patronizing him. He doesn't want to be accepted as a midget among giants. He wants to become a giant, but he doesn't think it's possible. How could it be possible? Your educational system provides a totally stimulating, loving, accepting, perfect environment for developing macro man. I, on the other hand, have spent 27 years learning how to be a micro man. I paused, realizing the enormity of what I was saying. I was admitting to myself the impossibility of ever being equal in awareness to my alpha mate or to any other alpha members, much less Leah. Coming from my little fantasy of a permanent translation to 2150, to the harsh reality that it was totally impossible, drained every ounce of energy from me. My body ached with its own weight. My throat hurt. Suddenly my face was wet with tears. I could see Carol and Rena only dimly. Rena was saying, Whenever you really ask for help, and not just pity, you'll always receive it. But I was tired. Very, very tired.